he was like, don't touch oh, your face, do this. I, and yeah. <laughs> I think we're live. So, hey, everybody. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I was actually chatting to Dr. Gershwell before we started because it's been a while and we had to catch up. And thank you so much for being here. And as soon as the chat opens up, if you have questions for Dr. Gershwell, you can certainly type them in and I'll read them to him. If you're not familiar with who he is, Dr. Nate Gershwell is the founder and the director of the Fasting Escape, which is located in Yorba Linda, California, not too far from Disneyland, which is now closed. We were chatting about how I'm 60 years old, and I've never known Disneyland or the Las Vegas Strip in my entire life to close. Dr. Nate Grishold was a staff doctor for many years at the True North Health Center, and he started his own beautiful, beautiful facility in Yorba Linda, which we're going to talk about, and much more, such as is fasting safe to do on your own, especially during these times. So welcome, Dr. Gershwell. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Chef Edgy, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's, it's such a pleasure talking to you. You know, me, you guys may not know this because his name is Dr. Nate Gershwell, but he also has another profession as a podcast producer and host of my favorite podcast, which is called Beat Your Genes. They have over 200 episodes now, and each episode gets released at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. You can listen to it on Spotify, Stitcher, Blog Talk Radio. My favorite way to listen to it is on iTunes, because then I can put the speed up to 2.0 and get it done a little sooner. Not that it's something I want to get over with, but if you're very uh, concerned about the, uh, the COVID-19 both Dr. Hawk and Dr. Lyle, the co-stars of the podcast, have done several recorded episodes. You can hear about that. So um, what say you, Dr. Gershfeld? How is this affecting you and your business? Well, this is a really interesting time right now. I, <clears throat> I'm young, so uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm relatively new in practice. But from my mentors, uh, people who are dealing with this, and uh, the patients that I talk to, this is you know, the first time that this is something like this has ever happened. Um, and so the, the most common questions that I've been getting uh, about fasting have been, you know, is fasting okay for the flu and for, for the, uh, this coronavirus, COVID-19 infection? Uh, what, what, what's the story with that? As far as patients here at Fasting Escape, so like you said, Chef AJ, we're at Fasting Escape. Um, this is really uh, a safe haven uh, for, for health optimization. So uh, we're kind of, I look, we, we have patients that come in. Uh, so for example, in the healthcare system, we've got patients that are at the very end of the healthcare system, meaning they have health problems and they need emergency care. They need to be kept alive. Um, whereas uh, fasting escape is for patients who are trying to prevent disease and maybe trying to reverse disease without the drugs. Uh, and so without before being too far gone. And so we're kind of taking patients in from, from that area of the, the healthcare system. So um, <clears throat> we're really trying to prevent future complications. Um, so we are still open right now during this time. Um, I'm screening everybody who's coming in uh, to make sure that there's no, no issues going on. Um, the, just the nature of the fasting center here is that all the rooms are private. So nobody's sharing rooms, nobody's sharing bathrooms at all. Uh, we're doing laundry service for all the towels and sheets, you know, regularly to make sure that everything is sanitized and, and, uh, and, and keeping at a distance. All the rooms are private rooms again. So with private bathrooms inside the room. So, uh, you know, Dr. Lyle calls us an introvert's paradise, which means that if someone were so inclined, they can stay in the room the entire time. And I would just be coming and checking them in their rooms uh, and replacing water and whatnot. So uh, it is a very private place uh, for this. And so we haven't really been affected other than people who are a little bit worried and maybe this, this has uprooted or upended their life a little bit. And as a result, they may have had to postpone their stay for a couple of weeks from now or a couple of months or something like that. But, but overall, all, you know, business as usual, we are trying to, to help people get healthier. That, that's going to be a big thing uh, moving forward after this whole thing calms down is, uh, is trying to stay healthy and prevent health, health because, you know, let's suppose you're, you're one of the very few people that is at high risk for this, uh, this coronavirus COVID-19. Uh, that's going to mean that you, uh, you know, you can't really do anything about your age, but you can do something about the age of your cells and the age of your arteries in your body uh, based on how clogged they are, <clears throat> how much rich foods you've eaten throughout your life, uh, how, how many other comorbidities you have, like high blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, things like that. So uh, we're trying to affect that. I think as this thing you know, calms down, where people, hopefully people will start paying attention a little bit more to the things that they can control about their health. 
That's great. And I know as a fan or a student of evolutionary psychology, you don't believe probably as much as I do in astrology, if at all, but Dr. <laughs> Nate is a Virgo. So you know that they are meticulous as far as cleanliness and, and, and dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And I've seen the place, I've, I've been there a few times when Dr. Lyle has spoke and it is, it is absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And it's interesting because people are choosing not to fly and flights are canceled. So I figured that both you and True North would have be struggling, but you're actually fuller than ever because now the people have so much time off that they actually yeah. have the time because they're sheltering at home or they've been laid off or furloughed and they actually have the time to drive to your Belinda or another fasting place like True North and actually finally do the fast. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a couple of people. So the people here right now are local. So, uh, they've driven over, um, you know, they, they, I've screened them, make sure they haven't been out of country, uh, out, you know, in risky places, but they, and again, they're in private rooms. So, uh, they're staying in their rooms for a couple weeks at a time anyway. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> this has opened up a little bit, a little bit of free time for people, uh, particularly with their health goals, because, um, I very often hear from patients, oh, I just don't have enough time. It's like now all we have is time. You know, we, we don't have, we're not going and doing things that we normally need to do. Uh, and things are a little bit more disruptive uh, now. So on one hand, there's more time to focus on this. On the other hand, that little disruption uh, can sometimes play a role in people's relapses uh, with regards to their you know, cravings and taste buds and whatnot. Absolutely. I think it's the perfect time to take control of one's health destiny. And when you don't have to eat, it's, it, you know, you don't realize that even when you eat healthy, uh, eating does take a long time. I mean, you know, the shopping and chopping and eating it. When I just think about just me and my husband, the amount of time I spend prepping food, if you don't have to worry about that, you got a lot more time. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the number one thing patients who are fasting here, they tell me is they didn't realize how much time it takes because all of a sudden, and, and we're making the food for them and washing the dishes. So, so they're eating the food and it's still taking 30, 40 minutes to eat the food sometimes longer. And so that's, you know, almost three extra hours uh, a day that they have to think about something else or do something else. <clears throat> It's, I've never water fasted. I've juice fasted and I didn't like it, but I, I, I'm so afraid to go without food. Like even I, I did it once for 40 hours just because I was grieving when, when a dog of mine passed away. But I, I just, it seems like it's, it's going to be so hard. Yeah, it is. It is tough. But the we, we keep in mind, why do people do anything? And it's because they determine that the cost of doing such a behavior is worth the benefit of such a behavior. And so uh, when people really look at water fasting in context with their health problems, and they look at, for example, something like high blood pressure. So high blood pressure is the, the number one predictor of all cause mortality, death from anything. And so you may be looking at the mainstream media right now, and they're saying that one of the biggest risk factors for this uh, coronavirus is gonna be high blood pressure. And it's because it's the number one risk factor for all cause mortality and, and all kinds of other issues, but it's the most common predictor of, of a heart disease as well, congestive heart failure, um, stroke risk, uh, heart attack, et cetera. So uh, let's take a look at blood pressure, for example. So medications uh, can have a role in blood pressure uh, but that's very small relative to lifestyle uh, lifestyle modifications. So, <clears throat> so relative to the the benefit uh, and the cost, uh, the cost of medications are high. Okay, it's not just the co the financial cost, but there are side effects and there are there are disease you know there are problems that are happening in the body when you're taking drugs. And so, the level of blood pressure for which the medication risks are justified is very high. It's about 160 over 100. That's when blood pressure medications are worth it relative to all their risks. Uh, whereas with diet and lifestyle and fasting, for example, so John, John, Dr. John McDougall, who you had on a couple of, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, he had a really phenomenal study that he did. People came to his McDougall program and they stayed for 11 days. Uh, they, they did the study for 11 days. And in just 11 days, almost two weeks, they had uh, almost 50% higher blood pressure reduction than the medications do. So medications lower blood pressure risk, to the top, uh, lowers blood pressure to the top number, 12 points. Dr. McDougall showed that you can, uh, by having a healthy diet and exercise and adequate sleep and removing alcohol and having a low salt diet and removing, uh, removing uh, uh, alcohol and, and uh, decreasing salt, you can lower blood pressure by about 17 points. Now, water fasting, it turns out that if you remove everything, not just lower the salt intake, not just lower the alcohol intake, but if you do every, if you remove everything and then you refeed with a health promoting salt, oil, sugar, so a sofa's free diet, 
all of a sudden now the blood pressure comes down by 37 points on average. So that's, that's almost triple the, the, uh, the blood pressure reduction through medications. Okay. So, so we're, you know, as far as the cost versus the benefit, uh, you, you're doing great as far as the diet's going. So I wouldn't necessarily be, be pushing it, you to do a water fast if you didn't need to, but if someone had high blood pressure and they just couldn't get on the diet for whatever reason, because this is a really tough, you know, the pleasure trap is very strong. Uh, and so if someone just can't seem to get on a healthy diet and they just can't seem to lower the amount of salt in their foods, then we have to lock them up. Okay. Then we bring them to jail, lock the doors and all we can eat in the house is healthy food. And we prep for the water fast. We do a water fast. And all of a sudden, after you get that reset and that break of your taste buds, you get that momentum back. And all of a sudden, a couple of things happen. One is your taste buds lose the, uh, oh, hopefully my, there we go. Hopefully the, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so number one, the, ta- the fir- first thing is the taste buds will lose their, their taste for, for high salt, high fat foods. Uh, the other thing is the blood pressure will reduce and people lose some weight and they get, they catch up on sleep and rest, relax and, and get that momentum back. So really what we're doing with fasting is we're, we're altering that cost benefit is now you're feeling better now and you're getting so much benefit. The cost of eating healthy is a lot less because you don't have to go outside your comfort zone. You're already there. Nice. Julie says, Dr. G's clarity and specificity is so satisfying. Yeah, how can you be so smart if you're so young? <laughs> we got another nice comment. I don't want to embarrass Thank you. Thank you very he much. Said, That's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I've met with the good Dr. Nathan. He's a wonderful young man. The fasting escape sounds like a wonderful experience for those with critical health issues in the quest to change their lifestyle choices and obtain optimum health. And she's a 10-day graduate from the McDougal 10 day program in March, 2012. Well, you must've just finished it because you oh, that's wonderful the program for, I think at least until summer. So mm-hmm. well, yeah, see them, the, some of the McDougal program is great because the people who complete the McDougal program are called, I think he calls them the McDougalers, right? Uh, and then true North, they call them the true North navigators. Well, at fasting escape, the people who finish the fasting escape problem, we call them the escapees. So <laughs> we're, we're trying to escape the pleasure trap. And, uh, and sometimes a week or two or longer can help you to get that momentum boost so you can escape the, uh, the pleasure trap effectively. That's so funny. Some people spend their whole lives trying to escape. It's, it's a tough, it's a, it, it is a, it's probably the most difficult thing that many people can do in their entire life. And, and it's not just me saying that it's not just Dr. Lyle. Like I've heard this before from people twice my age who have been through some serious things, you know? And so this is, it's is a totally unnatural process, which is to, to try to beat our genes. <clears throat> and this is what the podcast is about more broadly, not just about diet and lifestyle, but, but really what we're trying to do that that's, you know, that's what struck me about Dr. Lyle's explanations about the pleasure trap was that we were trying to beat our genes. And it really appealed to me because it's, it's, it's a worthwhile, uh, worthwhile journey for the rest of our life. You know, I mean, we can do everything we want, but at the end of our lives, when we look back and we, we, we face the battles that we fought, you know, we want to look back at them, you know, uh, we've lost some, we've won some, but we want to look back and be like, man, that was, that was a, that was a fun battle. Uh, and so, you know, this is a battle worth, worth fighting for a lot of people. Nice. Marina says I'm an escapee. It's too bad. We can't like, if we escape the pleasure trap, we should get some kind of medallion or something, right. which of course they'll take away from us if we relapse. But I, I think about yeah. when I was little, we had an ice cream parlor named Farrell's. And if you could eat this, the six scoop hot fudge Sunday, you got this ribbon that said, I made a pig of myself at Farrell's, which is exactly, you know, yeah. the pleasure trap. But I'm thinking, you know, at this point, Dr. Goldhammer, you guys should be giving us like little ribbons when we escape, you know? I think, I think, yeah, you give the, the thing is, is that no one, no one who's, who's not actively trying to escape the pleasure trap really cares about it. In fact, they are all actively trying to sabotage you. So really the church should say, I escaped the pleasure trap and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we have a lot of people uh, in our community that make t-shirts like this is from yeah. uh, from Ready or Not. And I wear a lot of potato wisdom. So I know we could get you those shirts for- Yeah, yeah, we, we, make them, we make them like half a size too small. That way, if you start getting uh, relapsing, then now you can start to feel it quickly. That's so <clears throat> funny. So, you know, I met you just when you, I guess it's called your boards or whatever you took as a doctor. You had just passed, I remember mm-hmm. We're so excited. What 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 was the most exciting thing about working at True North with Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer? What like 
because to me that sounds like it'd be so great, such a great experience. Oh yeah, I, I was like, I was in celebrity shock the first time I walked in. So <clears throat> a lot of people don't know this, but Dr. Goldhammer looks surprisingly similar to my dad. So, and it's, it, we're not related at all, but it just, just so happened to be, you know, he just looks very similar. So when I first walked into True North as an intern, um, <clears throat> I walked in and, and uh, I was, he was just standing there in the courtyard, staring, staring at some, something. And, and I looked and I, I did a double take. I was like, how did dad get here? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but no, the, the most, the most fun part at true North was you actually get to see people get well. Like I remember calling my dad every night, the first, uh, so <clears throat> a little bit about my journey at true North. So I was an intern there during my school breaks. So I was there for, uh, about three years on and off every couple months, I would drive up there for a week or two or three. Uh, so the first time I got there was for three weeks, right before I started chiropractic school. And I remember calling my dad every night saying, oh, this is, these are the conditions that I saw today. And so I was lucky enough to have an intern who was uh, interning with me at the same time. And she was a medical doctor from Johns Hopkins University and who had graduated from there. She's in practice, private practice. And so she was explaining to me all the physiology of all these conditions that I was seeing and basically giving me a little tutorial session about it, teaching me how to take blood pressure and whatnot. So um, it was really exciting to watch all these conditions actually get better. Things like high blood pressure, type two diabetes, and it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just subjective results. It wasn't people saying, "Oh yeah, I had a little headache and it got better." Oh yeah, I had had a little back pain and it got better. It was it was objective results. Their blood tests were actually coming back better. So, uh, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, people were losing weight. <clears throat> Particularly, I remember people with autoimmune diseases like lupus, psoriasis, eczema. They were getting phenomenal results just by water fasting and eating a healthy diet. So. It was a really uh, eye-opening experience that this was actually possible. I had just read about it in books, and every time I would contact the author who read the, who wrote the book, asking them if I could come and and stay and watch this whole thing and intern for them, uh, it, you know, oh, we'll call you back. We'll, you know, we don't know. We're not really open to that. And then when I called Dr. Goldheimer and asked him the same thing, he goes, "Yeah, sure, but you got to get a degree first. <laughs> so it was it was totally yeah, you were supposed totally to be an open. engineer and you were studying to be an engineer yeah i graduated as engineer it just uh i just didn't feel like working as an engineer uh it just wasn't as appealing to me and my my junior senior year of, of engineering school i started to really get into this stuff uh and it got so interesting that that uh, i decided that that's that that's what i wanted to do um, but nowadays we see people coming in, you know, this, like I said, the pleasure trap is very, very difficult to get out of. Uh, many people don't fully get out of it for the rest for, for their entire lives. Uh, but the people who do try, uh, they try valiantly and, <clears throat> and this, this ends up being a major, major part of their life. Uh, and so that's what I was starting to see. <clears throat> and through Dr. Lyle's lectures, uh, people were trying to figure out more and more detail about it. So it, it, True North was is an amazing place. And I hear that they're so busy now that um, uh, that that luckily Dr. Goldheimer is sending me their overflow uh, when they have it. So that's that's always that's always fun. So uh, Kathy says, I missed the intro. What is the doctor's name? Where is the escape? This is not an escape room, by the way. For some people, maybe you <laughs> wish it were. This is the fasting escape, a therapeutic water only uh, medically supervised fasting center. It's in your Belinda, California. And the doctor's name is Dr. Nate Gershfeld. You've referred a few times to the pleasure trap, but I'm, I'm assuming we have people watching that aren't familiar with the concept or the book. So maybe explain what it is. Sure. Yeah. The pleasure trap <clears throat> is a book written by Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. And it, it makes a very interesting case and a very compelling case that in the modern world, we are attracted, uh, well, actually all over the place, uh, uh, every animal is attracted to three major motivations, which is to seek as much pleasure as possible, <clears throat> to avoid as much pain as possible, and to, to conserve energy in the process. And so this happens all over, uh, everywhere, uh, but with respect to health uh, and specifically food consumption, what's actually happening nowadays is that <clears throat> our nervous system is uh, is actually uh, it's trying to achieve efficiency as far as food consumption, and the most efficient foods nowadays are the foods that have more calorie density. Okay, the ones that have the most calories per the most bang for their buck. So you can imagine how uh, our ancestors, maybe a few thousand generations ago, uh, they may like salad or they may like vegetables and fruits, but it will take them several hours to go gather enough fruits and vegetables in order to get enough calories to survive for the day, for the week, for the month. 
Okay. And, uh, and, and so in that time, they're going to be looking for more efficient sources of calories. And so the more efficient sources of calories there are, the more likely they're going to be wanting to eat them. And so, uh, so if we look at the modern world, the modern world, we've been able to develop foods that are extremely calorie rich foods that were not able to be found or didn't even exist a few thousand generations ago. And so as a result, our brain still interprets those foods as being more valuable, uh, but they're not, they're not more valuable. They're only valuable as far as calories goes. They only solve the problem of, of calorie deficiency. And so we end up focusing, our brain interprets that as the major problem because all of our ancestors developed in a world that was com completely deficient. Uh, there was scarcity all over the place and there was tough com competition uh, with regards to calories. And so now we put us, our brains in the same, in different environment with now totally uh, filled with rich foods. And all of a sudden our nervous system starts to make a mistake. And the mistake is overconsumption, okay? Blind overconsumption blind overconsumption and intellectual parity with that, with that overconsumption to the point where people say moderation is totally fine and everything is good in moderation. Well, let's take a look at what people were eating 50 years ago versus what they're eating now. We are not eating moderately. Okay. We're eating moderately compared to the average person, but the average person is overweight or obese or getting there has risks for type two diabetes, if not already. Uh, has high blood pressure, if not already, has heart, heart problems, if not already diagnosed, has uh, coronary blockages, or at least beginnings of that, has high cholesterol, kidney problems. <clears throat> They're sick with the flu very often, th several times a week, uh, several times a year. Uh, their immune system is not doing so well. So, so this is going to be the average person. Uh, so the pleasure trap uh, is when people get trapped by the high stimulating uh, effect of the, the processed and the rich foods. And as a result, uh, they're, they're kind of blinded to the fact that they're getting affected in their health in such a negative way. And so this is why they call it the, the, the hidden force that undermines our health and happiness. Because on one hand, the interpretation from the brain that the high calorie dense foods are valuable gives us pleasure. So it actually tastes really good when we eat it. Okay. So the benefit of the behavior is reinforced. Okay. The cost of the behavior, uh, we don't see it as quickly as the food. So we might not see the effects of a poor diet for 30 or 40 years. So if you're 25 years old and you're going out to the bars and drinking every night and you're eating, you know, lots of animal rich and, and, and rich foods, it may take until you're 50 years old for you to develop a condition that's, that's, uh, that's significant enough for you to actually see it on the lab work, okay? Or for the medical system to actually detect it and show you, hey, listen, this is your, this is your blockage over here, or your blood pressure is high enough. This is, it doesn't say that these foods aren't bad for you. It tells us just how resilient the human body is to all these, all these foods and all these environmental uh, problems. And so the pleasure trap is where people don't really notice uh, that and and even if they did, even if they had a heart attack, or even if they had a, a stroke or a, or a mini stroke, or they had their blood pressure come back high, or their uh, their their blood sugar is high, or they're overweight, any of these number of things can come back, uh, and and because the food is so addictive, it's like nope, that's not the problem. I already eat healthy. Oh, I, I eat healthy enough. I ate some chicken, <laughs> okay. Or I don't eat I don't eat red meat. I just eat fish a couple times a week. See what I'm saying? So what happens is now uh, the negotiation begins. Uh, and so we can see that this can happen with someone who's addicted to alcohol, for example. Okay. Oh, I only drink a couple of drinks a night. Okay. We can see this happens with people with drugs, you know, and, and when we look at why this happens with drugs, for example, drugs will give people enormously high, higher endorphin release and therefore dopamine uh, than, than uh, normal behaviors. And so it's no wonder why people get addicted to drugs because the reinforcement is so high relative to the cost that the, the, the behavior will always be rewarded no matter what. Okay. Whereas, and the same similar thing happens with, with uh, high natural, high processed, high calorie rich foods is that the reward is so much higher than what's natural that the cost benefit analysis actually gets incorrectly assessed. And so now uh, the behavior of eating the rich processed foods is going to take precedent over anything else. 
unless someone gets a significant enough health problem and they're lucky enough to have heard Chef AJ, McDougal, Dr. Lyle, Dr. Barnard, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, uh, all these people, you know, all, all the leaders in the health movement, if they've been lucky enough to hear all these people, Dr. Esselstyn, only then, uh, and they're open enough and they're willing to take action, only then will they start to see if they can come out of this pleasure trap. But until then, it's like, good luck. You know, this is, this is such an unnatural problem. Uh, that it's really it's it's really taking our our population, you know, uh, by a stronghold. I mean, if we look at the obesity rates uh, rising up from the 1985, for example, uh, and you were plot, you know, the CDC. Uh, I know everyone right now is focusing on the CDC for the the coronavirus and COVID 19, but if you go back and you look at the CDC uh, obesity trends starting from 1985. Uh, they actually have an interactive map that shows every state and how obese every state is getting every year uh, for 20, 30 years. And you can see, if you didn't know that that was obesity, you might think that this is a, another pandemic, okay? But, uh, but this is another thing that's going on with our health and the pleasure trap. Uh, the, it wasn't until I read the pleasure trap that I realized exactly why. Like, not like, oh, because people are eating more. No, no, no. Let's look at precisely why. It's because the rich foods are exploiting a loophole in human psychology. And the loophole is if there's high calorie foods, we're going to, we're going to engineer all of our activities. The, the genes in our, in our body are going to engineer our muscles to go, go towards it. Okay. And so that's why we're dealing with all these problems uh, is the pleasure trap. So I hope that makes sense. It kind of went long winded, but no, it, it was beautiful. It was really a very detailed, but very easy to understand explanation. Zena writes, the trap is what feels right is wrong. What feels wrong is right. And that is true because so 100%. Many people, I couldn't have said it better myself. We, we um, I had Dr. Lyle on the other day and there were so many questions and I couldn't get to all of them. But one of them was about, uh, somebody was asking like all these programs now, even in the plant-based world on emotional eating. And you know, mm -hmm. on the podcast or just in general, Dr. Hawk and Dr. Lyle have a very different take on emotional eating than most other uh, practitioners. They feel mm -hmm. that it's that's not what the problem is. That, but the problem is the pleasure trap because right. there was no emotional eating during times of scarcity. Right. There was emotion. And that's the thing is, 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 uh, you know, I, I think that, that sometimes the, the Dr. Lyle and Dr. Hawk's message gets, you know, I, I really appreciate their focus on the issue, which is yes, people can be eating, uh, because they feel emotional. Okay. They're the, like Dr. Hawk said, the committee in your head that says, well, you've, you've earned it. You know, you've dealt with all this, you know, this stress from your life. And so a little bit won't hurt. Yeah. That that's, we're not, they're not discounting that that actually happens, but the, the reason why people are, are overeating is because the foods are unnaturally rich. And so it, it's, you're not going to emotionally overeat two pounds of broccoli. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just so unlikely. I've never met someone who says, Oh, my boyfriend broke up with me or, you know, my, my mom had a fight with me. My sister said something and I, all I, all I wanted to do was go into my kitchen and, uh, and open the freezer, take out the frozen bananas. Oh, never mind. I didn't want those. I actually, I want to take some steamed broccoli and I ate three pounds. Like I, I just, I'm sure it can happen, but I just never heard that. So what typically will happen is people say, yeah, I, I, I went to the store and got some rich food or I went to the freezer and opened up and got my Hagen dazs ice cream. You know, that, that suggests that, that the emotional eating happens, but it's not, it's not the main factor going on, which is the pleasure trap is what's actually going on. If you were stuck in fasting escape, for example, or you were stuck in, you know, the, the back country, or you were in a place where there was no unhealthy foods at all, and you got an emotional event happen, you got triggered somehow, or some, something happened that, that, that got you uh, upset and, and emotionally uh, in a place that, that wasn't pleasant. Uh, you, you would probably want to emotionally eat, but you'd probably want to do other things as well, but you just wouldn't be there. So, so the issue wouldn't, wouldn't come up, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to eat that many lentils and rice and potatoes and whatnot. So, so I think and that the clear, you don't get as much dopamine from the food. Yeah. I mean, you'd, you would have to eat so many lentils, I think, to get that dopamine right. response. And, and by then you'd be it just fit in your stomach. Yeah. Things. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think the, the issue to keep in mind is, is that, that if we focus on, oh, emotional eating, does it exist or not exist? I think, I think we're going to be moving the wrong direction. I think we're going to be trying to focus, you know, it's, it's almost like, like a boulder just like fell crashed through your living room. And the big issue is like right there, but we're trying to sweep up the cobwebs in the corner. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. The, the emotional overeating, fine. There's people do get emotional and they do start to eat unhealthy, but I don't think that's the biggest issue here. Right. People are just, uh, they're, they're just, they're oblivious sometimes to the pleasure trap and its effects. Uh, yeah, or they can't it get shows out of it. you just how addictive it is. Mm -hmm. It just, just how addictive it is, because you can imagine if we look at this, like an alcoholic, you know, we may, everyone here may have known a friend or a friend of a friend or so who's been an alcoholic. And, and if you, if you actually ask them, you know, how unreasonable they were, it's like, they'll tell you, and you can sometimes see it if you meet someone, it's like, are you sure you want to go, go out to the bar? It's one 30 in the morning, last calls at two. And how are you going to get home? It's like, Oh no, I'll, I'll work it out. It's like they, they, they have not thought through it because they're just so focused on getting the pleasure from the alcohol and also not having the negative effects. So, so yeah, this is, it happens. And, um, but, uh, but fasting escape, I mean, what we do, we're, we're, you know, a lot of people can carve themselves out of it. Uh, or at least intellectually, they know that they need some place for help. And that's, that's, you know, if you wanted to get better at soccer, you'd hire a soccer coach. If you want to get better at doing webinars, you, you, you go to webinar conferences, you know what I mean? So, so if you, and if you want to get better at health then you go to go to places where that's what we do, we, we put you in a place, we know, we understand the psychology of it. We understand the, the, the chemistry of it. And we just have to break that cycle and get you back on track. And it's, it's so worthwhile as, as I was a victim for 52 years and the last eight, my life has just been amazing. Not having to go there, you know, Dr. And you look wonderful, even though there's no, uh, all, all the hair salons are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I cheated. I got a haircut. You know, Dr. Goldhammer <laughs> often says true North where we make good food tastes less bad, but I've eaten at the fasting escape and the food is delicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It turns out the secret, uh, to, to, to my cooking is you just starve everybody for a couple of weeks and anything tastes really good. So, so yeah. the issue with, uh, you know, we, we try to make everything here is fresh local. Uh, there's local farmers here that, that I've known for 15 years that I've been shopping for myself for 15 years. Um, and so I get all my produce, almost all the produce that I can from the farmer's markets. Um, and so, yeah, we try to make food really, really palatable. Um, there is an issue though, is that if someone's coming from a diet of rich foods, um, <clears throat> then sometimes whole natural foods without salt, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, coffee, uh, sometimes those can taste more bland. Uh, and that's totally normal. That, that would be exactly what we would expect if your taste buds are used to richer foods. Okay. What something else we would expect as well, though, is that if you remove the rich foods from the taste buds long enough, then taste buds will, will adapt. Just like if you're in a room right now, Chef AJ, uh, and the lights I can tell are, are just the right level of brightness. If you go outside uh, and the sun's right now, it's what, one o'clock, one thirty. If you go outside and, uh, and, and go outside in the sunshine, it's going to be much brighter than it is right now. Okay. And if it's much brighter, that means your eyes they don't just stay, stay as dilated as they are in this room. Okay. They have to, they have to adjust. And after a few minutes, they'll adjust and it's going to look normal again. And if you come back into the room, it's going to, you're going to kind of have to adjust again. So that time frame for taste buds to adjust to the taste is anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Okay. And that's going to, it's a little bit dependent. Sometimes people have been eating pretty healthy and they've just had a bad cycle. It may take short, shorter time, but 30 to 90 days is in general how long it takes for the taste buds to get used to whole natural foods without all the salt, oil, and sugar. And unfortunately, most people don't want to or can't give it that time. because Yeah, or I've they don't Dr. know. Yeah. yeah, I've heard Dr. Lyle say, we're not supposed to just be able to tolerate whole natural food. We're actually We're designed to love, to love it. Yeah. And once you get out of the pleasure trap, I, I love what I eat. You know, it yeah. doesn't have sugar, oil, salt. It doesn't have high fat. It, I, I mean, sweet potatoes and broccoli, meat, to me, tastes like amazing now. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is testament to the dopamine rush that happens when you're supposed to, when you, that when you're eating food is you're supposed to feel pleasure when you're eating food. The problem is, is that if you're, if you're used to the pleasure created from the high calorie dense foods, it creates a bit of an addiction where now the hyper normal stimuli is what you're after. Uh, so we give that a break for a couple of weeks 
uh, on fast on just water. And all of a sudden you come back and you're eating healthy foods and they taste really good. In fact, that's the, that's the most fun that I have here is when people are done fasting and I'm making food for them or my, my chef Luce is making food for them is to just watch them eat uh, relative to how they were eating a couple weeks before that. Uh, and just how the food tastes good by itself. We don't have to add a lot. Of, we don't have to add dressing. We don't have to add anything to it. Uh, and so that's really fine, fun, fun to fun to watch. Now, to me, it's just so it's escaping the pleasure trap is just really it's true freedom. Mm -hmm. Kathy says, "I've stayed at the fasting escape and had a great experience." Doctor G helped me so much. We have a question. Oh, we have a few you. questions actually. I'd like to read to you, Florence. And I hear this question a lot: If weight loss is the goal, but you have no health issues so far, all labs normal at this time, do you suggest water fasting or is proper feeding adequate for weight loss? So in general, proper feeding is adequate in weight loss. So I'll just say that off the bat. However, let's take a look at the, the other factors that can be playing a role in uh, potentially seeking fasting for weight loss. So let's suppose somebody's trying to lose weight and they're on your, your program, Chef AJ, and they're eating the food and, and they just can't eat the food. It doesn't taste good. And they just keep slipping up and they can't do it. At that point, then we might consider coming up and getting locked up and doing a short fast. And the reason for that would be a couple of reasons. Number one is if you just, just change of an environment where you don't have anything going on other than you have to be here and eat the food, uh, all of a sudden now your brain can relax. You don't have competing, uh, competing uh, uh, activities that your brain is essentially trying to decide. Am I going to eat the chocolate cake that that uh, that's in my pantry that my you know husband is is keeping, or am I going to abstain it? All of a sudden now you take willpower out of the equation. Okay, there's nothing here you can't eat. Okay, so uh, you take willpower out of the equation. All of a sudden your brain can relax. The second issue is if you do a water fast, all of a sudden your taste buds get very sensitive. And so whole natural foods, like you said, Chef AJ, they actually taste really good. They taste very good. So much so that when you go home, uh, now you're looking forward to your steamed vegetables and your broccoli and your sweet potatoes and your potatoes and rice and beans. And you're not, as, you're not craving as much the, the rich, uh, unnatural processed foods. Okay, so there's a benefit there. So that's, that's what I'd say. As far as fasting for weight loss, Yes, we see, you know, 100% of people who fast are going to lose weight. It's just a simple thermodynamics problem. So movement of calories means that if you under eat calories, you're going to lose weight. If you overeat calories, you're going to gain weight. But let's, let's get a little deeper than that. So yes, we're not in conflict with, the, with physics when we look at this thing. But let's suppose we only ate one French fry every day. And that's all we ate. Would we lose weight? Yeah, we would. Okay, because you're only eating one French fry. Okay. But a French fry is not very healthy. So we're not really going to be losing weight in a healthful way. What are we doing when we're done losing weight? Are we just going to eat one French fry forever and then eat whatever we want and then eat one French fry? No, we're going to want to design a plan so we can live sustainably. Okay. And so whole natural foods is going to accomplish that because number one, you're not going to be hungry all the time. You can eat plenty of food and activate those stretch receptors and get plenty of nutrients and not get enough calories. And so you're accomplishing everything all at once and you're not feeling miserable because your stomach's under underfed. You're, uh, you're, you're not eating enough volume of food. And so <clears throat> that would be the reasons to, to come to a place. But uh, if, if you can't come to place, particularly now, let's say you, you're, you're shelter in place and you can't leave, or, or maybe you don't have the means, or maybe you just, you just, you know, feel like you want to do it at home. My suggestion is, is read chef AJ's book five times. Okay. Watch all of chef AJ's webinars, watch Dr. Lyle's information, get educated, do a little mini retreat at your place and just focus on eating the food. Okay. Do a little, you know, retreat in place. Okay. Do your own retreat at home. When all of a sudden you've got five days where all your job is, is focusing on is making the food, prepping the food, practicing dishes, getting a re developing a repertoire of dishes so that you have a couple of go-to meals when you're, when you're not sure what you feel like eating. So all of a sudden now you've done a little five day little boot camp, and, and now you've, you've uh, retreated in place and now you've got some skills. Okay. Something that, that we do here is we actually do cooking demos. And I, I just did this with somebody a couple uh, last week before they went home is they actually washed their hands, put on the gloves and actually chopped the food themselves. And this is somebody who didn't know how to steam vegetables. 
So we went back to the basics. We just steam the vegetables, show them, okay, this is how you chop the vegetables so it steams very quickly. And <clears throat> here's how you make French fries. And here's how you make you know, some soup. And here's how you make this. And all of a sudden now, uh, the guy left with four or five dishes in his repertoire. And this is, this is somebody who had never been, never cooked at all. Okay. So if that's you fail, okay. Have a fun time failing. Okay. If you're not throwing away some vegetables and some dishes here and there, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Uh, maybe wear gloves. So you don't, you know, I wouldn't want to say if you're not cutting yourself, then you're doing it wrong. That's not what, <laughs> but if you're, if you're shopping and chopping, you want to practice. Okay. Get, get chef AJ's program. She's got a lot of recipes in your, in your, is it uh, two books, but the, the, the one is the, uh, the secrets of ultimate weight loss. That's got patients love that book here. They're, they're eating you. lots of recipes here. Uh, and they can't believe how easy it is that they can fill their stomach. So, so yeah, you certainly don't have to fast all the time. Uh, and it, it may be a good idea if you're in, in certain cases, but you can certainly eat this way at home and practice eating even one salad a, a week or one salad a day, or trying a few dressings or trying a few, a few dishes. That's the thing, because fasting is not a quick fix. It's not a one and done. And, you know, for the eight years that I participated at the holiday cooking extravaganza, True North, I would see people that were there and fast and they'd come back heavier the next year. So clearly they weren't doing any kind of health promoting program in between fasts. Yeah, it's a tough thing to, to deal with, uh, especially going home where it's not a very supportive environment. And so it is a very tough thing to do. And so sometimes people may need to do a fast, get reset, and they hold on as long as they can. They, they maybe do really well for three months or six months, and then things slip up a little bit. And then by that time, it's now nine months or a year. And so and then they come back and they do another reboot. But it's, you know, it's something worth adding to, to your mix, whether it's here, True North or anywhere is have a little health retreat at your, by yourself at home or somewhere else. Just, just, you know, I, I when I, when I was in high school and in, in uh, yeah, when I was in high school, I had a, a summer job and I used to work there and it, this, it was this big company production company. Every six months they had inventory. It was like every six months they had a, they had an inventory of all the things they did and a little, little, uh, a break for all the workers, but but it was to assess the company and actually make little fine tune, fine tune adjustments to make it run better. Okay. This is maybe what, what, uh, what we may want to consider with our bodies is this is why people take vacations. But nowadays, if, if you could take a vacation and you're, you're, you're getting blackout drunk every, every other day, or you're eating rich foods, you might come back less healthy than when you left on vacation. Uh, it may be worth considering doing a short vacation or a staycation nowadays. Uh, just focus on shopping, shopping, eating the foods. And if you need to do a little water fast, then, then let me know. We can schedule something like that. But, but, uh, but you certainly can do this at home, especially with the food. Well, I love your idea of retreat in place because it's been about two weeks now since we've had to shelter in place. It may be two months. We don't know how long. And Ruth has posted, now is an opportunity. It's been easier for me to be compliant because I'm not going out and exposed to pleasure trap foods. And that's how I've been looking at this. This would be a great opportunity right. for people to do this as a reboot and a reset. Right. Yet if you watch the interview with Dr. Lyle a few days ago, other people were saying, oh my God, now that I'm home, I cannot stop eating whole natural food or because I'm so anxious about the virus, I'm eating crap. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, th this actually brings up another point, which is that if you're that, that, you know, the reason why people don't have very much stress and willpower around eating healthy foods at the fasting escape or a place like true North uh, is, or, or Frank Sabatino's place or whatnot is because, uh, because we don't actually have any junk food here at all. So even if there's a craving, what's happening is a patient's like, well, do I have to go through the trouble of having, getting an Uber driver to go drive me to God knows where, cause I don't know this area and I don't know where the next, you know, 7-Eleven is. And now Dr. Gershfeld's going to be watching me leave. And, and then I'm going to explain that I went and got some, you know, Cocoa Puffs or whatever it is, right? There's a lot of cost associated with, with getting off the program. And there's, a, and there's not very many benefits. So we've simply altered the cost benefit analysis. Okay. So we just don't have any food here. So it just costs a lot of energy to go out and get it. Okay. So if you're sheltering in place and you're in, if it's possible, if you, if you're living alone or if you're living with people who are supportive of this is, is clean up your environment. Don't have junk food you know, or tempting foods around you. Okay. In your current environment. Okay. And that, that would be a useful way to take advantage of the shelter in place. 
is set up your environment and meticulously clean your environment so that, you know, nowadays you'd have to go to the grocery store to restock, but you go to the grocery store anyway, do it once. And all of a sudden now you're, you're like, oh, do I have to break the quarantine? And I can't go to the grocery store several times, a, several times a week to get the junk. All of a sudden you're just upping the cost of keeping junk foods in the house. So anything you can do in that regard is going to be helpful for sticking on the health goals. Uh, beyond that, it's, it's just, again, this is how tough the pleasure trap is. A lot of people will, uh, well, I'll talk to them on the phone when we do. Uh, so sometimes I'll offer uh, phone consults for people uh, thinking of going to fasting escape uh, and we'll talk. And sometimes people will be, be quite embarrassed that they just can't stick on the diet. And I have to remind them that this is how tough the pleasure trap is. Okay. This is how tough it is. This is not a testament to somebody's integrity or their, their honesty or their, or their, uh, their intelligence or their laziness. This is how tough this pleasure trap is. So we keep that in mind, but what we can, what we do have control over is the, the, uh, the cleanliness that we can keep our environment. So yeah, clean out the junk food, start making some healthy foods. Terrific. So you had mentioned Dr. Frank Sabatino. I was supposed to have my 60th birthday party at a retreat yeah. there, but <laughs> it's in a hotel. So the hotel is closed now because people mm -hmm. are asking, are there other places, perhaps in Canada, where people can water fast, or is it just true north in Santa Rosa and fasting escape in your Belinda? Yeah, I think there, I, I, as far as the other places, I don't know which ones are open. I know that I talked to Dr. Goldhammer recently just because I was nervous about this whole thing. And I just was asking him what they're doing and, and to business as usual, we're, we are considered an essential uh, service, I think. So uh, yeah, we are, we are considered an essential service. We're, we're basically seeing patients and we're keeping with the social distancing guidelines. Everybody's private room. It's all, you know, all the rooms aren't closely packed together anyway. So yeah, all, all is good. And I'm screening people before they, before they come in both on the phone and in person uh, when they arrive. So uh, we're keeping it safe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. If you're, if you needed, if you need to fast, uh, especially if you have, if you're at high risk because you have high blood pressure, type two diabetes, you're overweight, you're obese, um, you've got, you know, these types of things, give me a call. We'll assess it and see if it makes sense to come out uh, and do a fast. If not, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll yell at you for a little bit and see what food you want to be eating and see if, see if that sticks. So you seem like a sweetheart though. You don't seem like a gold hammer. I can't imagine. You <laughs> I yell at a very low volume. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, should they go to the website fasting yeah, to find the phone number if they want to have a yep. consult to see. Yeah, the, the, the biggest thing, uh, yeah, the main thing is if you go to fastingescape.com and if you, there's a little tour of the place, so you can kind of get an idea of the program, but it's very similar uh, to the True North program. We're just a lot smaller, about 15 times smaller. We only have four beds, uh, but you can go through the program to the tour and then you can also click on uh, registration and that just, uh, that just opens up a window where you can book a phone consult with me. And that's if you're thinking of going uh, or if you're, you're just not sure, and then you can schedule it and then we can chat and see if that makes sense. Very nice. What about people with active eating disorders? I would imagine if they're anorexic, fasting is not appropriate, but so many people I know suffer from bulimia often with the, you know, with the vomiting still happening. And, and I know them personally, and they, I've seen them at True North and they never disclose that. Could this be a dangerous thing for somebody with an active eating disorder to, to go to a, a center? Or is it a good thing if, if they tell you the truth? Yeah, it's going to depend heavily on the the uh, health history of the person. So I would want to speak to to people individually, uh, you know, as as we're you know screening them out for for whether or not they'd be a good candidate. But in general, uh, the people who are bulimic uh, and are vomiting uh, as a result of the, they're feeling like they ate themselves, they ate too much food, and they're they're throwing up afterwards. Um, if we get them on a health promoting diet, all of a sudden, uh, and we do it long enough, and we understand the ins and outs of this thing, all of a sudden now they can beat their genes. Okay, they can understand how this is happening and what's going on in their mind and what distortions they're having surrounding their body and surrounding the volume of food that they're eating. And so this, and and sometimes we can clear out their taste buds if needed uh, with a fast. Uh, again, this is in, highly individual, but we can clear out the taste buds so that the healthy food actually tastes really good. Uh, and so you can maintain a healthy weight on a health promoting diet. Uh, and so that's, that's going to be our goal is to, 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 to do it more as far as education goes uh, than anything else. 
Nice. You mentioned the word beat your genes several times. So how did that come about? And, and you guys were like under the radar, like for a year, you never told me that you had this podcast. And then I had to listen to like 100 episodes in a week. <laughs> and now you're over 200. So I, I mean, how did this great collaboration between you and Dr. Lyle and now Dr. Hawk come about? Well, so when I was going to True North, uh, so the very first time I heard Dr. Lyle talk, uh, was when I was a patient at True North, but this was at the time where True North was called the Center for Conservative Therapy. So this was back, they had a little, they had a house kind of similar to Fasting Escape, but it was a house in Pengrove. And I went there as a patient and I, Dr. Lyle did a lecture about embarrassment status and like all, all these terms that now we hear about on the podcast. And I remember I was on my fourth day of fasting. So I was like trying not to fall asleep. And I was like, my eyes were going shut and I was, and I remember thinking, God, I hope he doesn't think that I'm bored because this is fascinating. So I ended up passing out, falling asleep and ended up uh, waking up. And then uh, over time, I read the pleasure trap after I left. Oh, and the funny thing about the pleasure trap is, is, uh, you know, I got overcharged accidentally. There was like a billing error uh, after my stay at True North. <clears throat> And uh, the the uh, the admin person who was telling me about this, she goes, yeah, there was a little billing error. I noticed it. And she says, well, rather than me having to go and undo it and having to do a bunch of paperwork and stuff in the computer, why don't we just give you the pleasure trap and the health money cookbook? And that way it'll be fine. I said, no problem. That's great. So the pleasure trap sat on my shelf for like several months. And then I started reading it. It's like blew my mind because nothing I could find was contradicting anything that I'd read before. Uh, so, and this concept of understanding how the gene work and how the world works uh, was really fascinating to me. But it wasn't until I got to True North as an intern that I started listening to Dr. Lyle talk. And through all of his lectures, he would weave in how this is what your genes are trying to get you to do. And that may not always be what is in line with your happiness, just like eating unhealthy foods. So your genes are trying to get you to eat calorie rich foods because the genes interpret high calorie rich foods as being very tantamount for your gene survival. Okay. But that's not in line with our happiness. So he kept re weaving in that we want to know how to beat the genes, beat the genes, beat the genes. And so uh, when I came down to Southern California, you know, got my chiropractic practice started and things were going well, I called Dr. Lyle and I said, hey, I've, I've been thinking about this beat the genes concept like for a long time now. And, and you know, I've got some extra time now. I wanted to start a podcast uh, and just have you on as a guest a couple of times and just weave in the beat the genes theme uh, and just invite different guests and and, uh, and see what they all say about this. And he goes, and he said, well, that's a really good idea. Let's talk, let's chat about this. And he goes, I, I was thinking of doing something similar as well. And I said, well, perfect. Maybe we can just do it together. And that way we don't have to like do it separately. <clears throat> and after the first episode, I was like, I don't need any other guests. I just want Dr. Lyle. So, <laughs> and it was way cheaper than paying him for an hour of therapy anyway. So I, ended up I, I know it's great. I always think about like, <laughs> I'm so blessed to that he inter I get to interview him so many times and I'm thinking, yeah, this is great. I can sneak one of my questions in. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, usually I don't have to Dr. Gershwell because almost always everything that's on my mind is somebody else has already asked and, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so just to reiterate that, you know, if you, if you have symptoms, you know, respiratory distress, fasting, you don't, fa the fasting is not the cure for that. But if you're healthy, a couple of days at home might be okay, but not right. because you think you have COVID or something like that. Right. Yeah. We, we don't want to be, you know, there's no studies right now that, that recommend fasting for, for the coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, we, you know, so, so I can't comment on that. Uh, in general though, the healthier you are, the less impacted you will be uh, if you get any disease. So any infectious disease. So uh, we want to make sure that you're getting adequate sleep, make sure that you are eating fruits and vegetables uh, sufficient to maintain your ideal body weight. Uh, and hopefully if you do that, you won't have room for anything else. Uh, you want to make sure that you're exercising. And so maybe hard to do right now, but uh, maybe do a few dance, dance moves in the living room, you know, 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, go around the block, whatever. But um, you want to do the normal things that keep you healthier which we're going to find that, that no matter what infectious disease someone might have, they're going to lose their taste uh, for food. So your body's going to institute its own fast one, you know, very often. Uh, so if that happens uh, and you're just happen to get sick, like a normal flu, then you're going to notice you're not that hungry. Uh, if you're suspecting you have coronavirus, then call your doctor, get screened, and then follow their instructions. So uh, we, we don't, we're not treating people here at Fast Escape for any communicable diseases. So we want to keep that in mind. 
Nice. There have been a couple of comments about condiments and you can find condiments that are completely salt free, like ketchup. Oh. Well, uh, yeah, ketchup. Well yeah. Well, your world. Yeah. Well, your world. And yeah. I'm going to be interviewing Dylan on uh, actually tomorrow at 1 PM. And mm -hmm. there's a mustard you can buy called West Spray that they use at True North and at your place and at my mm -hmm. place, my place, meaning my house, that's completely salt free, which you can also easily make condiments. But she's yeah. talking specifically about teriyaki sauce, which is mm -hmm. very high in sodium, even low sodium. And we have watching live my Thursday guest, Thomas Allen from California. Yeah, from California Balsamic. Balsamic. Yep. And he makes yeah, a teriyaki a, vinegar that it's tastes delicious. like teriyaki yeah, they sauce. They have a teriyaki, I think is teriyaki heat or something like that. One of the teriyaki basil. You yes, know, it's some, amazing. Some of, so that's what I would do. Word. But Ruth yeah. has an interesting question about neuroadaptation, which you spent mm -hmm. some, some time explaining very well. It's easy for me to be vegan, six years vegan now, would never consider eating something not vegan. If I managed to go sofas free for a year or more, do you think I could feel that way for sofas free? I mean, I do, because now the other food dish doesn't taste good to me. And it's, it's not doing it to prove any point or be special it's just that those the food doesn't appeal to me yeah it's you're forever food. ruined yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think it's worth an experiment uh you know if a year sounds too daunting uh you might try shorter than that but yeah it's worth an experiment i wouldn't be surprised if you got used to the salt oil and sugar-free foods because this is how your taste buds were designed there was no great quantity to salt oil sugar or anything any type of flavorings a thousand generations ago uh, so, so th there was a little bit of salt and there might've been, you know, it might've been some other herbs and spices, but, but in general, yeah, you could probably get used to a, a diet without sofas. Okay. So Tinker says, sorry, if this has already been asked, but I'm currently morbidly obese. And even though I'm on a whole food plant-based SOS, I'm assuming she means SOS free diet. I'm high risk and it's obvious. I'm not going to be thin in a day. What say you, you true. You won't be thin in a day. You lose about an ounce or two ounces of fat in a day, but you can certainly be healthier in a day in every single meal. But I'll let Dr. Richel answer that. Right. So if you're morbidly obese, then, then you've got a lot of work to do. Okay. And so, uh, the main things right now is, is, uh, if, if you've got other, other health, uh, you know, if you've got other risk factors for this coronavirus outbreak, uh, then, then you want to minimize your exposure. Okay. As, as much as you can. So listen to the guidelines. Uh, but as far as what you have control over is you have control over the 21 decisions uh, throughout the week that you can eat. So focus on those as much as you can, uh, and you can start small. So if you're, I don't know what your diet's like currently, but you said it was, you know, whole food plant based, pretty much SOS free. Uh, so I'd say if you if you stick to that, uh, we can see that you're probably going to be losing anywhere from one to three pounds per week. Okay, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on exactly what you're doing. Uh, but if you do that, and you're morbidly obese, so, so obesity is defined as 30 pounds overweight on a five foot four frame, and morbidly obese would be a, a BMI over 30, uh, 35, I believe it is. So, um, <clears throat> So if you are morbidly obese, that means you've got maybe, if you really stuck to this, maybe about a year, maybe two uh, of stick of, uh, you know, one pound a week, one pound a week is going to be 50 pounds a year. Uh, in two years, that's a hundred pounds. So if you're a hundred pounds overweight and you can manage to diligently just, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone and, and, uh, uh, and, and just keep doing this, then, then we're looking at two years or a year of you being a completely different individual. So, uh, that's going to be enough time for us to flatten the curve and whatever else needs to happen for, with regards to this pandemic. So I wouldn't necessarily, uh, be, be, uh, be overly concerned, uh, because, you know, this is the best that you can do. Don't, don't, I hope this isn't interpreted as me, you know, not being worried about this pandemic. It's more that as, as with regards to your particular health goals, this is the best that you can do so far. So you focus on that and, and then we're going to be a much, much different thing in a year. Right. And just do something. I always say just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. And please, right. you know, this, this virus is serious. Our heart goes out to all the healthcare workers on, and all the people on the front lines that are having to work and risk and the, the people whose families have it. And, but, but you can't use this as an excuse to stay in the pleasure trap. You know, right. because this, you'll always have an excuse to stay in the pleasure trap because, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know if you watch the, the weight loss summit, Nate, and you've got to be a guest on it next year. But Josh Lajani said that it, the, 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 the New Orleans Saints, if they hadn't won that game, he might still be 400 pounds. I mean, he was like basing it on whether or not the football team won. You can't. Yeah, with, let, this, 
Yeah, what what this sounds like to me, uh, and I don't know specifically this particular person, so so please don't interpret this as me calling them out or claiming that I know the ins and outs of their psychology. But but sometimes what can happen is is if the expectation of a particular goal is is set fairly high, and the nervous system, if a person may or may not believe, they may not believe that they can actually do it. Uh, then the nervous system is designed to actually back away to save face. Okay. And so <clears throat> if I hear something like, well, you know, if this thing is going to kill me anyway, why bother trying essentially? Uh, that's when we start to think, okay, this could, this could have, you know, this could be the ego trap. Okay. Which Dr. Lyle has talked about uh, both on the podcast on an, and on, and on your, uh, your, your summits as well as Chef AJ. But the ego trap very basically is, is that if you, if the expectations, for example, if someone's hundred pounds overweight, that's an enormous amount, uh, amount of diligent effort that needs to be summoned in order to lose that weight. Okay. And so, you know, that's a year now for someone who got hundred pounds overweight, it can seem extremely difficult to imagine that for an entire year, they're going to have to stick on a, you know, very healthy diet. Okay. And so they can sometimes be overwhelmed with that. And so therefore, they may back off and, and, and the nervous system is actually looking for reasons not to do it, to sa- essentially to save, to save energy, okay, and to save face. And so what I would say if that, if that is you is you don't have to lose all the weight at once and you don't have to do this for a year. What we want to do is just, just do a short experiment, okay? So for the next two weeks, we want you to be uh, making your salads, uh, getting some repertoire as far as your vegetable consumption and your dishes and, and just get a few, get a few lessons, cooking lessons of your own under your belt, uh, and get a few meals that are good under your belt and then keep that momentum going. Okay. You don't have to, so there's, there's uh, so three meals a day in one year. That's a, almost a thousand meals total, a little more than a thousand. So you don't have to eat all those thousand meals at once any more than you have to drink five gallons of water in one day. Okay. We want to sip slowly. Okay. We want to eat these meals one at a time. We want to make these meals one at a time. We just want to prep and, and uh, practice. And essentially what we're trying to do is get lost in the process, have fun with it and just get lost in the process. We want to tune out everybody who's commenting about our journey. Uh, we want to just keep doing it. Okay. And you'll find it's, it's like if you're running a marathon, you, you can kind of hear people on the side cheering you on and yelling at you, but you're really not using their cheers to motivate you to cross that finish line. Okay. That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you're trying to run the race. You're trying to finish that marathon. And so you don't want to be, you know, paying attention too heavily to the voices that are telling you, yes, you can do it or this or that. Just, just put your, put your head, you know, roll up your shirt sleeves and, uh, and get to work. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to focus on. You know, you explain and articulate the concepts of Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer so well and it's a very, it's a gift. And I, I just realized this, as long as I've known you, if Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle had a baby, it would be you. (laughs) 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 It just came to me now. So (laughs) Dina says, should I throw out my brown rice flour? I use it to make a whole food plant-based chocolate mud cake. I would probably tell her to throw out the the chocolate. And yeah, yeah. what is the mud made out of? That's what I want to know. Yeah. My attitude generally, so I get a lot of these questions. It's like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? So, you know, the engineer in me uh, starts to look at this as what's the actual, what's the actual question about? Okay. So, you know, I'll get, well, what about the brown rice flour? What about agave? Or what about, you know, stevia? Or what about this? And what about that? I've never really been asked, well, what about, you know, kale? Is that okay? Or what about broccoli? Is that okay? Like I've, I've never been asked questions about the low calorie dense stuff. It's always about what about the higher calorie dense things, okay? So we keep in mind that the higher the calorie density of a food, the more, the the easier it's going to be to to gain weight when you eat it and to overeat it, okay? So I don't know the rest of your diet, okay? If someone's eating plant foods, vegetables, everything like that, and they're eating a little bit of brown rice flour with a med cake once a month or something like that, that's probably not a big deal, 
Okay. But if they're making processed flour foods and they've got the mud cake with a bunch of, you know, vegan butter, earth balanced butter and all the rest of the stuff, then, then yeah, we're going to, we're going to have a problem. So in general, we look at the context of the entire diet, uh, and the, the lower the calorie density, the easier it's going to be to lose weight and the higher calorie density, the higher it's going to be, the easier it's going to be to gain weight. Okay. However, uh, it's, it's not like, well, what about this or that? Everything is going to be in, in con uh, is, it has to be in, in consistency with, with, uh, with thermodynamics and physics. Okay. So it's not like if I'm teaching about gravity, you're like, well, what about the book and what about the, the tissue box and what about the fan and what about this, right? It all, it all works. It just depends on what you're trying to do. You know, it's funny because even though I, think I have the, uh, I, I'm able to withstand the pleasure trap. I've, it's been about eight years. I had one slip very early on when I didn't understand the importance of, of environment and, and having food ready at all times. But when it's around, it's just, it bangs on my brain and it's all I can think about. So for example, on March 22nd was my 60th birthday and I live in a, a senior community and I have a neighbor who's vegan. And so she made me some oatmeal raisin cookies. Now these were completely compliant. Dr. Goldhammer would approve these cookies. It was a forks over knives recipe, which she tweaked instead of maple syrup, she used dates. It, they had some raisins, it had oats and, um, you know, but it was a cookie and, and I was able to, I mean, she only gave me a limited amount, which was right. good. You know, I think she gave me, and then Charles was getting into it, which isn't fair because he can eat any kind of crap. Don't eat my cookies. <laughs> I think yeah. she gave me like maybe 12 or 16 cookies and they, they weren't big. And so, you know, I would, I would have one, you know, every day. The thing is, is I would look forward like now every day I'm going to have a cookie and I'd have right. a cup of tea. And then it started being well, if I'm having one cookie, I may as well have two cookies. And then like yeah. on the third day, it's like, boy, wouldn't it be great if I took some, you know, plant-based ice cream and put it in between the cookies. So then I was right. having, and again, the ice cream was completely compliant, date sweetened, yeah. but it was torture. The pleasure trap is strong with this one. Yeah, it was a week. I mean, it didn't affect my weight, believe me. I can right. eat these. And I, because the calorie density is still low enough, but just having these foods there, it's like, oh, it was just torture for me. And it's like, I, I, I didn't want to give them away, but I, I could, it's just, I, I can't coexist with pleasure trap right. food, even if it's of a low caloric density. Right. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was, there was a bell curve distribution with this, whereas some people are going to be much more susceptible and much more, uh, much more caught in the pleasure trap in the face of these foods. And some people are just like, ah, Okay. You know, I remember, it, you know, all throughout school, I was like a vending machine, you know, addict. I, I everything in the vending machine, I'd be, I, I'd have tried it at least once. Right. And I remember sitting next to this girl in eighth grade and she's like, has a bag of Lay's potato chips uh, with some chocolate pretzels another bag of chocolate pretzels. And she's eating one per hour throughout the whole day. And I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> like I, I can, I can't even imagine doing that. And that yet you've got this girl who can just like one every hour and then she puts it away. And then during recess, she takes it out, eats one more and puts it away. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some people who can really, you know, abstain and there's, there's not such a big deal. And there's other people like you and I, where it's like, if it's around us, we're, we're eventually going to, we're going to eat all of it. So Ugh, it drives me crazy when I yeah. dine with Dr. Lyle, because he, Oh, we need to get the bigger food than you think. He said, <laughs> I'm kidding, Doug, if you're watching this, but it drives me crazy. It's like, he does it on purpose. I don't leave a bite on my plate. I mean, unless I didn't like it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just, there's going to be differences there. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it, this is also, it's worthwhile knowing who you are. So you've done, you've done enormous, an enormous job to figure out with great detail, exactly what you are. Okay. And you're not trying to change yourself. You're just trying to know who you are so that you can accurately and adequately structure your environment to tailor who you are. And so this is one great lesson in beat your genes. Uh, it's got a lot of implications in other aspects of life, but with regards to health food, Hey Bailey, uh, <laughs> with regards to health food is and healthy eating is know yourself. Okay. If you're, if, if you know that any of these foods are going to be triggering you and you're, you're just going to stare at them and you're going to have to exercise enormous discipline, willpower, not to eat them, then it may be better to, to do without them once in a while. Okay. Or all the time, you know, whatever, whatever it takes, but you may want to uh, have some experiments where, you know, you're without them for a week or two or three, and then you're without them a little longer, but whatever it is, you want to know who you are. And, and that way you're working more on your environment than you're working on yourself. Okay. There's nothing inherently wrong with you. If you're overweight, obese, morbidly obese, or have health problems as a result of the overeating, there's nothing wrong with you. Your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, which is number one, eat as many damn calories as it can. 
Okay, that's what it's designed to do by nature. And so if <clears throat> if if this is this is what you're doing, you're designed to do, there's nothing wrong with you. So you just want to keep that in mind and and just get to work based on uh, the environment that you want to create rather than working on yourself. Absolutely. That's why I said if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. In your mouth. Yeah. Let me read a couple of nice comments. Bethany says, Chef AJ, thank you for having so many live stream presentations. It's so helpful to get this information with such regularity during this difficult time. And thank you. I try to go live at least once a day, as long as we're sheltering at home. And I'm going to tell you all the interesting guests that I have coming up in the next week and more to come. And Honey Bee similarly said, thank you so much, Chef AJ. These conversations are a great consolation at this time. Your speakers give us such valuable information. And so I'm not just interviewing a bunch of people on COVID, although, you know, I find that's interesting too, because one of the things Dr. McDougall said, yesterday is is because it's so serious this is the time to you know to hunker down and start eating healthfully not use it as an excuse that we all need to to take this as a, as a call to action and so tomorrow i have dylan from well your world who has all these delicious sos oh, sauces yeah. and i'm not just doing doctors guys as much as i love talking to doctors and i could talk to doctors like dr gershfeld and lyle and goldhammer and we do go all day i'm interviewing people with some spiritual uh things to offer like Reiki and sound healing, interviewing my stand-up comedy teacher yesterday. I've got a, a minister coming up. So it's not, it's mostly the, you know, the plant-based stuff, but it's not just that. So just, uh, just so you know, just, I like talking to interesting people that I like. And uh, Thursday we have Thomas from California Balsamic, who's got some new flavors to announce that are going to rock your world. I've Ooh. tasted them. Friday, I have Alexandra Paul. She's an actress you might know of from Baywatch, but now she's a health coach and co-hosts the Switch for Good podcast with Dotsie Boych. On Saturday, I can never pronounce this man's name. He's the plant-based gastroenterologist, the gut, gut MD health, Dr. Will B. And he has a new book coming out called Fiber Fuel. And on Sunday, I have Dr. Reverend Linda Logan, who I'm sure you don't know, but she's made a difference in my life. I don't know who I have Monday, but on Tuesday, I have Dr. Judd Brewer from the University of Massachusetts. So if you have somebody you want to recommend to me during this time, uh, please do so. So Dr. Gershel, it's been so fun talking to you. I miss uh, seeing you at the Fasting Escape and those dinners that you used to have. Any final words for people about anything? Keep moving forward. Uh, we're we're in very interesting times, but uh, that that uh, that shouldn't change uh, what what we want to do with with regards to our health. Uh, so you know, be creative, find some fun fun things about this whole thing, and and uh, eat some veggies and have a good time, and keep watching Chef AJ's. I'm sure this is keeping people uh, uh, keeping people sanity in time like this. So yeah, and, really and appreciate you having me on. Thank you. And if you're sick of me, you've got over 200 episodes to catch up on on the Beat Your Jeans podcast. New episode will be opening for you tomorrow night at 8.30 Pacific yep. time. And Florence says, I agree with you, Chef AJ. Dr. Gershfeld would be the baby of Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. <laughs> and if you want me to get that t-shirt made for you, you know, Janine Elder of Potato Wisdom, she is a, a great designer of t-shirts because I think that would be fun. So thanks again, Dr. Gershfeld. It's been so fun uh, talking to you. I wish you every success at the Fasting Escape. And I just, I love your podcast. It's the only one that I really listen to with any regularity. And episode I'm 161, yeah. I'm going to tell everybody <laughs> right now, even if you only listen to one episode of Beat Your Jeans, Dr. Gershfeld talked about how how dangerous the ego trap was in addition to the pleasure trap. And episode 161 is one of the best explanations of the of the, um, of the trap. trap. And Wendy mm -hmm. Sachs, yes, I would definitely consider interviewing Zach Bush, but realize I don't have everybody's email. And I find that when you go through uh, websites, they don't get back to you. So if there's somebody you want me to email, email me with their phone number that I can text them or that email. So, okay. Last words. Cause I've kept, I've overkept you. I've kept you no too long. We got a yoga class coming. Uh, we That's got a it. yoga class going on right now anyway. So. All right. Well, good. <clears throat> All it's fun quiet. talking to you and, um, and take care and everybody take care and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks again, Dr. Gershaw. Hey, thanks thank so much, you. everybody. Thanks, Jeff AJ. It's, it's a pleasure. Right. Bye-bye. Take care.